Hello everyone, welcome to the channel Top Gate. In this video, I'll discuss critical section problem. So in the previous lecture, we have seen what is a race condition. We have also seen how to solve an example based on the race condition. So in this lecture, I'll tell you what is a critical section and then I'll tell you what is a critical section problem and then I'll tell you what are the requirements in order to solve the critical section problem. So let's straight away start the lecture. So the critical section says that it is that part of the program in which it tries to access and manipulate the shared resources. So if you read this definition, the most important word in this definition is the shared resources. Okay, so that means it is that segment of the code in which the process or the program is accessing and manipulating the shared resources. So I'll tell you this uh, with the help of a very basic general example. I'll also tell you uh, with the help of some uh, technical example. So let's suppose there are three processes. We have process P1, P2 and P3. Apart from this process, we have certain resources. Say the resource we have as S0 and we have S1 also, S2 also s3 also okay so there are three processes p1 p2 and p3 and there is a resource called s0 this s0 is a shared resource shared resource means p1 also can use it p2 also can use it p3 also can use it similarly we have resources s1 s2 and s3 s1 is not a shared resource it is a private resource of p1 that is only p1 can use s1 p2 and p3 cannot use s1 S2 is a private resource of P2. That means P2 can use S2 but not P1 and P3. Similarly, S3 is a private resource of P3. P1 and P2 cannot use that resource. Clear? So, uh, if we talk about the program, uh, suppose P1, it, it has certain instructions. Okay, it has certain instructions. So, if we write the instructions like this, similarly, uh, P2 also has certain instructions and similarly, P3 also has certain instructions. Okay, so critical section it is saying that it is that segment of the code, it is that segment of the program in which the program is accessing the shared resource. So this P1 will have certain segments. Okay, so there is one segment of code in which it is accessing the shared resource. Similarly, P2 also has one segment of code, it can be anywhere in the program, it can be in the starting of the program, it can be at the end of the program, it can be in the middle of the program. So there is one segment of code in which it is also using the resource S0 and similarly S3 also has one segment of code in which it is using this shared resource. Similarly, if we talk about the uh, private resource of P1, so it will also have one segment of code, that segment also can be anywhere. So that segment is using the private resource. Similarly, P2 also has one segment of code in which it is using the private resource S2 and P3 also has one segment of code in which it is using the private resource S3. So P1 is using its private resource S1, no one is getting affected, neither P2 nor P3. It is its private resource, it is P1's private resource, P1 can use it the way it want to use, clear? And P2, it is using S2 as its private resource, so no one, neither P1 nor P3 will be affected by the way how P2 is using S2. And similarly, P3 is using S3, its private resource, and no one, neither P1 nor P2 will be affected by the way how P3 is using that private resource S3. But since S0 is the shared resource, so when P1 uses this shared resource, P2 and P3 may get affected. Similarly, when P2 uses this shared resource S0, P1 and P3 may get affected. Now, how it will get affected? Suppose this uh, shared resource is a, uh, say, a document, okay? A document file is there and this document file can be read by P1 also, P2 also and P3 also. So, if we say that when P1 is editing this document, so at that moment, P2 should know that at this time, 
P1 is using this document. Therefore, P2 should not be allowed to either read that document or write into that document. Why? Because since P1 is editing that document, so when P2 reads it in between, it may read some obsolete values. Therefore, when P1 is using this document, P2 and P3 should not be allowed to use it. That is why we say that when any process is working in the critical section then other programs who are sharing the same critical section may get affected okay so that is why we say that this section in which it is accessing and manipulating the shared resource is the critical section okay so this section is the critical section and the section in which it is using its private resource that section is not a critical section why because no one is getting affected by that segment of code Clear? So that is called as the critical section. Now this is a technical example. Now I'll tell you with the help of some general example. Suppose there is a train. Okay. And that train has certain births. Okay. So if that birth can be, suppose if we treat that birth as a resource. Okay. And that birth is a shared resource. Why? Several people can use that shared resource. But all those people cannot use that same birth at the same time. So we say that that resource is a shared resource, but it cannot be operated. It cannot be used in a shareable mode. That is several people cannot use it at the same time. Clear. So that means suppose uh, I book my birth from station A to station B and from station A to station B, I can use it the way I want to. And while I am using that resource from station A to station B, no other person should be allowed to use that resource. If anybody comes and sits on my birth, there will be a fight between these two people, between me and that person who is coming uh, and sitting on my birth illegally. Clear? So why? Because that resource, however, it's a shared resource, but it is not being operated in a shareable way. Now talk about the private resource. Suppose I have my car, that is my private resource, my private property. It has certain uh, seats. It has uh, the front seat and the back seat. Okay. So the way I am using my resource, the way I am using my car, no one is getting affected. The person who is traveling on the road, who is moving on the road is not getting affected by the way how I am using my private resource. That is the same case here also. This uh, resource is uh, the private resource of P1. So in this segment of code, this process is using this private resource. P2 and P3 is not getting, uh, getting affected. It is its own property. It, is, it can use it the way it wants to use it. Clear? So that is why we call this section as the critical section. Clear? So when one process is using the critical section, no other process should be allowed to execute in their own critical section. And that when they are using the same critical region. If there are uh, several programs who have their different critical sections, that is they are using some different shared resources. So there is no harm in executing in those critical sections simultaneously. But if they are sharing the same critical region, no two process should be allowed to execute in the critical section. Clear. So this is a problem. Now, uh, in order to solve this problem, the solution to this problem must satisfy the three requirements. Okay, so I'll tell you one, uh, one by one all these three requirements. That is, anyone can, can give their own solution in order to solve the critical section problem. You also can give, I also can give. But every solution must satisfy all these three requirements. So I'll tell you what are the mandatory requirements and what are the optional requirements. Okay, so the first requirement in order to solve the critical section problem is the mutual exclusion. Okay, so this mutual exclusion says that when one process is executing in its critical section, no other process should be allowed to execute in its critical section. That I also already told you that uh, this accessing of the shared resource should be done in a mutually exclusive way. That is when P1 is executing uh, in the critical section, then P2 and P3 should not be allowed to execute in their own critical section. Why? Because in their critical section, they will access the shared resource. Clear? So that is a mandatory requirement. That is every solution must satisfy this mandatory requirement. If this requirement is not met, the solution is not correct. But if this requirement is met, the solution may be correct. Clear? Now the second requirement in order to solve the critical section problem is the progress. 
okay so progress means that the working of the process should not be stopped anywhere it should be progressed in any way okay now i'll tell you how this uh, progress works suppose p1 p2 and p3 they all are sharing the same critical section and uh, out of these p1 p2 and p3 p1 and p2 is willing to enter into the critical section and p3 is not right now it is not willing to enter into the critical section so out of this p1 and p2 which process should execute in the critical section first this decision will not be taken by p3 who is not willing to enter into the critical section so the decision of which process out of p1 and p2 will go to the critical section next will be taken by only those process who are actually willing to enter into the critical section if any process who is not willing to enter into the critical section will not take part in the decision making process of who will enter into the critical section next so right now p3 is not willing it may want to go into the critical section in future but right now it is not willing to enter into the critical section so therefore p3 should not take part in the decision making process of who will go to the critical section next out of p1 and p2 okay suppose uh, to meet this requirement i use a round robin approach so round robin approach we have already studied in cpu scheduling so round robin approach says that we have three process p1 p2 and p3 and they are sharing the same critical section and i am allotting the critical section in a round robin way so that means so p1 will enter into the critical section first and then it will give chance to p3 p2 and then it will give chance to p3 p3 will again give chance to p1 p1 will again give chance to p2 and p2 will again give chance to p3 and then again it will give chance to p1 so it works in a cycle so this will ensure mutual exclusion that is when p1 is executing p2 is not there p3 is not there when p2 is executing p1 and p3 is not there when p3 is executing p1 and p2 is not there so it is ensuring mutual exclusion but it is not ensuring progress why suppose p1 which is executing in the critical section it is now giving the chance to p2 to go to the critical section okay so there may be a possibility that p2 at this moment does not want to go to the critical section it is not willing to enter into the critical section at all right now but p3 is willing clear but p1 is giving chance to only p2 it is saying that i will only allow you to go to the critical section next i will not allow p3 to go to the critical section unless and until p2 goes to the critical section but p2 right now is not willing so p3 the decision of p who will go to the critical section next is indirectly being taken by p2 who is not willing to enter into the critical section right now clear so this should not work so this is not the progress okay the process will come to an come to a halt it will never be able to proceed unless and until p2 comes and intervene in between and it executes in the critical section and give chance to p3 to go to the critical section so this should not happen clear so progress says that the decision of which process will enter into the critical section next will be taken by only those process who are actually willing to go to the critical section clear so this is also a mandatory requirement in order to solve the critical section problem clear now the next uh, requirement is the bounded waiting okay so bounded waiting says that on every wait time there should be some bound that is the process should not be made to wait for more than the bound value in order to do, go to the critical section okay suppose uh, there is a process there are three process you can say p1 p2 and p3 okay and right now p1 is executing into the critical section and the time in the clock is 11 suppose okay so p1 is is executing at time 11 5 p2 requested to go to the critical section okay and p1 is executing so the system say, said that when p1 comes out of the critical section p2 will be given the chance to go to the critical section clear now at 11 10 p3 also came and it also requested to go to the critical section and right now p1 is executing okay so p1 
P2 requested to go to the critical section before P3 requested. Clear? So, at after uh, P1 has completed its work in the critical section, it came out of the critical section, say, suppose at 11, 12. Okay? At 11, 12, it came out of the critical section. Now, since P2 requested to go to the critical section at 11, 5 before P3, so it should be P2 who should go to the critical section. But system said that I will not allow P2 right now. I will allow P3. Okay. So P3 is given the chance to go to the critical section at 11.12. However, P2 has requested to go uh, to the critical section before P3 requested. But then also P2 is made to wait. Okay. So now P3 is executing right now at suppose 11.15 P4 came. And P4 requested to go to the critical section. P2 is also waiting. P3 is operating into, into the critical section. P4 also requested for the critical section at 11.15. Clear? Now, at suppose 11.18, P3 completed its work in the critical section and it came out. Clear? So, ideally, we should give chance to P2. But system said that right now, I will not give chance to P2. I will give chance to P4. Clear? So, P4 which requested to go to the critical section at 11.15 after P2 has given the chance to go to the critical section and P2 is still waiting in the queue to go to the critical section. So, this should not be done. So, on every wait time, we should add some bound value. Say, suppose the bound value is 2. That is, P2 should not wait for more than this 2 bound value. That is, after P4 one bound is P3, one bound is P4. So after P4, it is mandatory for the system to give chance to P2 to go to the critical section next. That is, on every wait time, there should be some bound value more than which the process cannot wait to go to the critical section next. Clear? So that is the main story of the critical section and the critical section problem. And these are the three requirements. Now, out of these three requirements, first one, second one is the mandatory requirement. Any solution must contain these two requirements. And the third one is the optional requirement. That is, if this requirement is meeting, it's good. And if it is not meeting, there is no problem. However, these two requirements are mandatory one without which the solution to the critical section problem is not complete, is not correct. Thank you so much.